Okay, ladies and gentlemen, friends and neighbors, both near and far, all around planet Earth who are into cars and things with wheels, it's time once again for another... Another quixotic episode of V8 Radio, Kevin. Quixotic. That's right. Wow. Uh, I am your host, Kevin Osti, joined as always by our esteemed co-host, Mr. Mike Cuball clark who is uh, apparently quixotic. A- amen. Uh, quixotic is an overselling adjective meaning impulsive or unpredictable. Oh, yes. Well, we definitely Much have the like unpredictable. This show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Without a doubt. Uh, well, you know, the only there's only one or two things they can predict every time as listening to this show. And one of them is that there will be an automotive trivia question. And the other is that the show will end. <laughs> right. <laughs> We make no predictions on quality or entertainment value or anything along no those sir. lines. No, no, no. Uh, did you happen to uh, be quixotic and uh, prepare a trivia question for us? As a matter of fact, I did, sir. And uh, let's let's have at it. All right, Kevin. Quick, simple, to the point. This is kind of a two-parter. Uh, what does the term "I got shotgun" mean, and ah. what are its origins? Wow, wow. So there's. Uh... There's history involved in this one. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, I got shotgun, and what I'm going to say is that when you when you utter the phrase "I've got shotgun," that means you're not driving the vehicle, but you're in the passenger seat in the front, and uh, that's the shotgun position. And it's you know, I'm going to say depending on the car, it's it's about the next coolest thing to driving. Mm. Because I will tell you a quick story. I, I I used to have an '81 Lincoln Town Car. Holy was, cow! Uh, oh yeah, that was. Uh, yeah, you know, my dad bought this. Well, all right. Here's the story. All right. So, my dad was a police officer, and one of his uh, his cohorts was a reserve police officer. So this guy only did you know a couple days a month or whatever it was. I I don't know what the uh, requirement was but his name affectionately to me was uncle jerry he wasn't my real uncle but you know you know friend of the family so and uncle jerry had a uh, a job uh, when he wasn't being his reserve police officer i think him i think his wife's family owned a spring company and he was busy in manufacturing and all kinds of stuff and he did pretty well so he would buy lincoln town cars cool yeah 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 and, and he bought them from our local dealer in town uh, where i grew up and it was looking back. It was pretty interesting because it was a dealership that we knew all the salespeople, and I grew up with the guys. Mm. And and uh, then my uncle would buy these cars, and he would trade them in every few years. Well, he bought this '81 Lincoln Town Car, brand new, and he went to to trade this thing in in about 1992 or so. So Ooh. it was about 11 years old. Okay. So this thing only had like 26,000 miles from new and wow. he went to go trade it back in at the dealer where he bought it, which was Parkridge Lincoln Mercury. And my dad got wind of this and said, Hey, what are they going to give you for this thing? You know, cause mm-hmm. it's an 11 year old car. And right. It was a great color. It was, um, it was a metallic rusty root beer, orangish red brown oh, wow. with a, with an orange pinstripe <laughs> Oh man! <laughs> Would this guy love the Cleveland Browns? <laughs> well, I mean, it wasn't brown though. It was, it was like rust. It was like reddish oh. brown, and the interior was the same color color leather, and it had a vinyl top. And I mean, it was everything that you could get in '81 on that car. It had everything. It had auto dimming headlights and cruise and an A track, and I mean, you name it. Oh boy! And. Um, so my dad convinces my uncle Jerry to sell it to him instead of trading it in. Okay. And and my dad did well. I mean, I think he paid 2500 bucks for it or something. I mean, it wasn't like a, a high value car. And this is, you know, right. 20, 25, almost, almost 30 years ago. And my uncle Jerry was doing him a solid, you know, because the dealer was going to give him either that or less. Mm-hmm. So he's like, sure, you can have it. So my mom drove it for a few years and then my dad was going to sell it. And I... Hornswoggled the car from my dad. Nice. <laughs> yeah. And of course, drove it straight into the ground. Uh, of course. <laughs> I mean, that's what you're supposed to do. Right. 
And my dad, my dad was going to trade it on an 87 town car for himself, a used one. And uh, I convinced him, you know, the same, I guess I used the same tricks that he used on uncle Jerry. <laughs> We're only going to give you 500 bucks for this thing, you know? So anyway, getting back to the whole shotgun story. Yeah. Uh, the place to be in that car was in the back. Oh, I bet. Probably had a huge back seat. It was ginormous. Like a couch. It was like a couch. It was a big, cushy, plush leather couch with armrests and vanity lights and ashtrays and oh, cigarette lighters and stereo. I mean, it was it was really cool. So for the rest of the cars, though, the place you wanted to be was in the shotgun position. Mm. And that, of course, is named after the non driving position in a stagecoach. Ooh. Yes. Boy, you went way back there. Oh yeah. Well you you said there was a historical component mm. to this question. So the origin of shotgun was the guy who was not piloting the team of horses, but who was holding the shotgun in case of some sort of attack to mm. uh to rip off the Wells Fargo stagecoach or whatever it was, or attack the people on board. So they called that the shotgun position. All right. And, and that is about a six and a half minute version of saying a very simple statement. <laughs> <laughs> a very colorful story, I, mu- I must say. A rusty root beer brown story. Yeah. 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 That color. Yeah. yeah. I wrecked that. Co- well, that's, a, that's another story for <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's my answer. All right. Tell me what your question is. Okay. Well, thinking that, you know, we're in a we're in a health critical time right now. I saw an ambulance go down the street the other day. And I thought, why the heck is that called an ambulance? So the trivia question to you, my friend, is where did the term ambulance come from? Come on, man. Hey. You it wasn't historical... enough that I got the la- last question correct. You had to just hammer me now. <laughs> it's not a hammering. <laughs> Where it's... did the term... All right, this is going to be an old curve dash answer. All right. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one. Yeah, that Every- was a great everybody one. Everybody liked that one. Yeah, yeah. All right, the term ambulance um, uh, is, uh, of course, part of the term ambulatory, which means to move. Uh, or the ability to move. So wow, that's impressive. An ambulance is a a vehicle that is set up to move people, sick people, from one place to another um, quickly. So, th- hence the term ambulance. All right, if that makes to any sense. Quickly move sick people. From one place to another. Yeah. From where they're sick to the hospital. From where they are sick to the hospital. All right. Well, I, I'm glad they came up with the term ambulance. Me too. To cover that whole sentence. Just for this show. Otherwise, they'd be like, hey, somebody call a to quickly move sick people from one place to another from where they are sick to the hospital. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I'm glad no, you get it. Let's just call that an ambulance and be done with it. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> well, very good. Yeah, not bad. Yeah, not bad at all. All right. So uh, back to the... Uh, the task at hand here. So, what uh, what's life like on your end as we uh, navigate through this uh, this crazy, virally uh, impeding time we live in? Yeah. Well, you know, I've been pretty much quarantined to the house, working from home. Um, I I miss being outside. I really do. Yeah. yeah. Um, I haven't gotten any work done on the GTO. I haven't been able to go hang out with Randy at all because we're all on lockdown. Um, yeah, I see these people. There's, you know, even some friends of mine who are like, yeah, you know, I'm home, so I'm starting like a bathroom remodel. In fact, Paul was telling us, our buddy Paul. Is that right? Yeah, that his, his wife um, ushered in a bathroom remodel during this time period. And I'm like, don't, aren't you working? I mean. <laughs> yeah, right. Most you know, people just because who are you're home, home doesn't mean you're available. <laughs> yeah. But I guess in his case, 
uh, he's able to do it at night. You know, oh. that's the only thing I can come up with, you know, because during the day he's managing his team of engineers all around the globe. Right. So, yeah. Well, my girls did paint their bathroom. I got that done. I ordered a cabinet for there for that room as well. Um, but that's the girls too. That's you know. yeah. So how do they do? They just you know they do some e learning during the day now. It started on Monday with Google Classrooms. They're done by like noon, one o'clock. So they have the rest of the day to just pick up do a whatever. paintbrush. What, yeah. what to what to pick up a paintbrush? Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so. Yeah, they're just trying to do that and trying not to kill each other, um, yeah. which is sometimes a losing battle. But, uh, you know, the quarantine fever gets us all every once in a while. Yeah, well, I've been fortunate to um, be able to spend some time in the garage, as you know, by my texts almost mm-hmm. every night. Yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> and which I look forward to. I'm sure you do. I do. Um, we have... A, uh, the staff of technicians are still working at the V8 Speed and Resto Shop, and they're doing a great job, and things are kind of rolling along. And I buzz in there once a day, sometimes trying to get there more than once a day, but try to watch exposure. You know, nobody knows what the heck to do, and that's that's the thing. Yeah. You know, it's like, uh, is it safe for me to go there? And, and my life outside of the shop is not necessarily risky because I'm home here. Right. Yeah. I'm not really going anywhere. Our local uh, grocery store has mandated a one person per shopping party. Oh, really? Yeah. So it's not like Kelly and I can go to the store. It's her or I or mm-hmm. whatever. So, so that makes it a little bit challenging. And, and um, But I can't give enough credit to our team. The guys are doing a, a, just a great job uh, staying focused and, and doing what they do and doing a great job of it. And we sent home a few cars and uh, it's been very nice to have uh, cars that are that are working well and doing what they're supposed to do and, and customers who are happy, who've mm-hmm. uh, provided public feedback that they're happy. In fact, you've helped out with a few of the videos. Yeah. Little, little behind fun. the scenes there. Yeah. You, you wonder who that voice is on some of the VATV videos. That's Mikey Q. Ball Clark, That's ladies right. and gentlemen. <laughs> Professional VO guy. Industry guy. Industry no guy. Yeah. Wonder no longer, people. It is me. <laughs> and so the i guess the last one you did was the uh the red 69 camaro right and that car was it was kind of an onion it it came in all nice and shiny but we peeled a few layers away and it it had some some things to fix yeah it 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 sure did i mean you don't really discover you know a freshly restored car that still has a bent subframe i mean that's just that's yeah. gotta be that had to be heartbreaking for the owner they weren't real happy about it and yeah. what was worse is that they had this car restored and then brought it home and i think it had less than 10 miles on the odometer oh, man when they called us and they're like we this car has been in our garage restored for like two years and we don't trust it. We just, we can't drive it. There's something wrong with this thing. Oh, man. And the person that did the work on it is no longer in the business of restoring cars. Person retired. So they're like, we don't know where to go or what to do. Yeah. So they brought it to us. And then we started our, our diagnostics on it and kind of, again, peeled away a few layers and found that, yeah, the subframe, it was bent, but it was restored. So it was sandblasted and painted and everything and put right. back in the car. And a Camaro, a 69 Camaro is a car that has... A unibody type construction where the the front suspension and engine and all that stuff bolts to a subframe, which bolts to the car. Mm-hmm. And then all the front sheet metal bolts to the subframe as well. Right. So it's all got to be right. Otherwise, yeah. and, and if, if you didn't know that, and I told you that, yeah, this, this car was rubbing the tire on the fender well, and we had a suspicion by the way the headlight doors fit. Is that right? Oh my gosh. <laughs> because one thing affects the next, sure. you know, and as we looked at it, we noticed that some of the front sheet metal pieces were, the, the professional term is hogged out uh-huh. uh, so that the holes were enlarged so that things could be forced into place because oh, uh, nothing fit the way it was supposed to. So yeah, that turned into a subframe change and, um, and then the strategy of the right way to do that. And, and we ended up leaving the wiring and the engine and everything in the car and just hung it by a, a cherry picker and, yeah, the guts off from underneath it, you know. And that's a pretty cool picture. Seeing the engine hanging in place, it almost looks like it's levitating. 
it's kind of freaky. Yeah, right? <laughs> it's a little weird. It is um, interesting. But, you know, I, I don't know if you ever watched the TV show House when it was on. Yeah. With Hugh Laurie. Sure. And the concept of the differential diagnosis. Yes. Where House is kind of the lead doctor, and then he gets his team of other, you know, brilliant cohorts, and they'll discuss a patient's symptoms uh, together and then land on a solution. Um, and, and we often use that technique in the shop, which is cool. Oh, well, that is cool. You know, somebody will say, well, what do you think? You know, and it's like, you're able to pool the knowledge of several people at the same time mm-hmm. so that nothing's overlooked or nothing is uh, uh, forgotten about. And the great thing is everybody has a mutual respect level. So there's no, there's no ego mm-hmm. involved. It's, it's just for the good of the car and for the good of the customer. Yeah, that's and great. And we all kind of landed on, well, what if we pull the subframe or leave the engine hanging and just fixture it that way? Why not? You know, so do it. Yeah. And it came out really well. The car ended up driving really, really nicely. And uh, uh, when we, we did a little video before we sent it home and, and shipped it off to the customer. And, and they were uh, they were kind enough to leave a nice positive Facebook review saying, hey, we appreciate what you guys did. Oh, great. And thanks for all the help. And Nice. Yeah. And, and it, like you said, it would be hard to go through a restoration and then have to redo a lot of the stuff and still yeah. be positive about the whole experience. Yeah. That yeah. would sour somebody I, I can imagine. But, uh, but luckily they ended up with a positive experience with this car finally. And then now they can, they probably have 10 times the miles they did since they got it back the first time on it already. Right. I think we sent it home with 350 or 400 on it. Oh, that's great. Uh, just from evaluating and, mm-hmm. and doing stuff. And, you know, little things, the more you drive them, and this is, you know, words to anybody, even you in your, your home garage doing it yourself, stuff reveals itself as you drive the car. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, that reminds me of a story. A long time ago, you actually came out to my house to, to look at my GTO. And because um, it was having some drivability issues and I had you drive it. And uh, we were both in the car, and when you slowed down, you could hear a thump, 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 thump against the floorboard. I said, what on earth is that? That has never done that before. And you knew it <laughs> immediately. You said, oh, that's your drive shaft because your transmission mount is probably bent because you've probably been jacking it there, and it's making the, the angles off. So, But there's just enough weight with both of us in here that it affects it hits the floorboard. And that's exactly what it was. <laughs> yeah. Boy, was I lucky. Yeah. I'd rather be lucky than good any day. <laughs> oh, you, you and me both, man. Well, that's, you know, uh, again, comes from experience. And, and uh, when we send these cars home, that's one thing we do is we put four people in them or five and drive them around because a whole new world happens when you compress the suspension sure. and change those angles and all the rest of it. Oh, yeah. I'm a believer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we've recently taken to some thermal camera imaging. So drive right. the car and then get a visual on the temperature of all four brake calipers. Are they dragging? Are they releasing properly? Cool. What's the, what's the clutch doing? What's the rear end temperature? You know, in addition to just like radiator and coolant. Sure. Uh, we want to know the mechanics of everything. And that uh, Camaro, again, um, after the initial drive, when we put the subframe in it and drove it, Came back and the rear brakes were at 345 degrees. Oof. Yes. And it turned out that whoever put the, the brake system together, it's a four wheel disc brake deal. They didn't have the push rod length correct from the master to the booster. Oh, really? So they were dragging the whole time, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eesh. And nobody knew it until you checked it, you know? And, 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 you, and you wouldn't have known it unless you had a heat gun to look at it. Well, I felt it. And, Did and you? what I felt was leaving the shop and driving down the road everything was fine and i turned around i was on my way back and the car wasn't coasting the same and those oh, rear brakes were they were starting to get hot and drag mm-hmm. and i you know I, again because i've been through this uh, that particular problem on my own car many years ago mm-hmm. uh but this is what you do you drive them and and you as a as a, a shop you know we hope that the problems happen when it's in our possession before it's a problem with the customer, you know, and then sure. we can present it and fix it and do what you Amen. need to do. Mm-hmm. Those are good policies, my friend. Good policies. Yeah, we do what we can. And we're lucky that we have a, 
just a great team that's in tune with all this stuff. Mm-hmm. So it's nice. It's a, it's unfortunate that we get too many cars that come from other shops that didn't go so well. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm not saying that we're perfect by any stretch because we, mm-hmm. you know, depending on the timeline of the project, there are cars where if a customer said, no, I want this home today, it wouldn't be done and it wouldn't be right. Yeah. You know, and maybe that's what happened. You know, I'm not trying to badmouth anybody, mm-hmm. but I do know that we, uh, we do spend quite a bit of time uh, going over things and identifying things that uh, uh, mm-hmm. were overlooked. And in some cases, shops, a lot of general repair shops, they're not used to working on this old stuff anymore. Mm, that's a good point. There's no OBD2 port on yeah. 69 Camaro. Well, know? I mean, you've had um, like com- computer command control carburation, and it, which was the advent of, uh, of, a, of an ECU since like 1980. So there's there's quite yeah. a few, a, a heck of a lot more ECU cars than non ECU cars on the road. So yeah, yep. that that totally makes sense. Points, condensers, and yeah. all that stuff. So, and we we enjoy that those challenges and they're and they're fun. So, mm-hmm. yep, it's all good. So the great thing today, you mentioned you you haven't been able to get out much, mm-hmm. um, which is unfortunate. We had our first. 80 degree plus day today oh that's nice it was nice man and again i i kelly and i went to the shop and i took a, a lap of photos to update the customers and and talk to the team and and did stuff there and then came back uh to the the garage office the v8 radio south studio mm-hmm. if you will and um did some work here with the door open. I actually had to turn a fan on today, and I thought, oh, wow, you, you poor know, I soul. Do, I should turn the air on just for my... <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Which I did not have to do, but... Oh, gee whiz. We got some good feedback on our top five garage tips. Yeah, we really did. Yeah, I was, I was pretty happy about all that. Yeah, a lot of guys want a lot of stuff for their garages. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Which is cool. Yeah. I'm just, again, lucky that I have a nice place to hang out in. Uh, and, and that does remind me, I'm going to sidetrack just a touch. Um, it's funny, I guess I end up knowing personally a decent amount of our listeners because mm-hmm. I get texts and I get emails, right. you know, from people that listen and they're either saying, you know, positive or negative or what, whatever, you know, I just mm-hmm. get that communication. But what I'm going to ask as a, as a V8 radio listener, wherever you are right now, if you dig this show, um, maybe help us out and, and make those public comments on the Facebook page or share them, share, share the show. Yes, please. You know, if you think you, you have a friend who digs this stuff or, or might like it, uh, go ahead and share it. We, we're not, you know, most of the time Mike and I do this with the understanding that nobody's listening. <laughs> <laughs> It's just him and I, and we're we're BSing uh, to each other, and that's how this whole thing kind of started. But um, it, it what what ends up happening is when the more people listen, we get a lot of good feedback. We get ideas for topics. We get uh, uh, interesting things to talk about because you know, Lord knows, we're lacking on that. <laughs> we even get trivia questions from, from from time to time. That's right. That's right. And, and by the way, your boy Alex sent me one. Did he really? Yeah, he said he was going to. I'm like, come on, come yeah, on. But that's not what I use this week. All right, uh, you got to keep that in your back pocket. I, I got you. That's cool. Eh, you know, you got to do what you got to do. Uh-huh. That's fine. Uh, uh, so, yeah, anyway, we'd appreciate it if you share it because uh, that that's fun for everybody. Um, so, anyway, I was in the garage, and, and yesterday we had a nice day, too. Um, and I took the opportunity to wash the new truck. Ooh, that is a beautiful truck. Well, thank you. Thank you. Mm-hmm. It's, it's new to us. It's, right. it's three years old now. It's a 17. Um, but a couple episodes ago, we had discussed my little mishap in the ice and snow where mm-hmm. I wrecked our previous 2006 Chevrolet and we're fortunate enough to replace it with a 2017. And it's a black Duramax mm. crew cab long bed L. LTZ. Oh man. The the magic four wheel package, which I'm not even sure what the LTZ package includes these days. Uh-huh. Uh and the blacked out treatment. And uh when we bought this thing, it it had some dings and dents and it had some scratches and stuff. And um fortunately our team was able to fix most of that, which oh, is cool. 
Sweet. Yeah, Kelly found a used tailgate that was black. Right. Uh, so Jeff, our, our uh, paint technician at V8 Speed and Resto, he he touched up a few things and buffed it out and swapped that for us. And then uh, uh, Brad, who's another uh, uh, guy who works in the body shop, kind of an all-around Brad can do anything, and, mm-hmm. and he did a lot of buffing, polishing, scratch repair, detail work. And then we brought in an outside resource, a guy named Brian Schilling, who owns a company called Dent Care, who's a paintless dent repair oh, nice. w- magician oh. is the best way to describe. I don't know how he does this, but he does it perfectly every time. I like to call him the fixer because <laughs> nice. we've had situations. I'm not going to say which car or cars, but, you know, we finish up a, a, a long-term build and something happens where you're looking at it and all of a sudden there's a ding or a, you know mm. something in the car and he's come out and fixed all those and nobody ever knew. So he went over it and pulled a few dings and dents out. So now it's nice and straight. And I realized that this truck is a new record for me. Not only is it the newest and most expensive vehicle that I've ever owned, uh, but it was the longest term of ownership I ever went before washing one of my own vehicles. Is that right? And how long a term was that? <laughs> well, from January to Holy April. Holy cow. I know. You believe that? Oof. What the heck's wrong with me? I bet uh, I bet it was looking a little crusty by then. Well, it, it, it was. It was dirty, and it's black, and I'm scared to death of getting it scratched up again. Oh, right. Yeah. So like, I mean... Especially black vehicles, keeping cars, you know, washed and, and, and waxed and polished and looking nice to me is like a, like a black art. And, uh, it's something that I always, I mean, I'm okay running my car through a car wash, my daily driver through a car wash and, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll dry it off. But other than that, I kind of don't get too deep into it because I'm scared I'm going to have swirl marks all over it, or I'm going to scratch mm. it or do something stupid. I'm going to snag some trim and rip it off. We do <laughs> something, something bad's going to happen if, if, yeah. I'm, if I'm left to do this on my own. Yeah, and that is the concern. Um, yeah. Luckily, I've been able to kind of develop a system over the years to, uh, to get results. And I'm not saying this is, you know, show car, Pebble Beach detailing, right? But, but a way to get them clean. <laughs> and shiny and protected fairly quickly. Um, in fact, we did a video on this in 2005, oh I'm going to say. Yeah. And I'm not even sure it's on YouTube because that was before YouTube, kids. That was Ooh. a long time ago. Yeah. But it was a, a, a segment on VA TV where we shared some detail secrets. And I was able to still use that system yesterday. And essentially... And no doubt you've seen these things evolve. Um, I've been using a, a hose foam gun. Okay. You ever see those? I have. Yeah. And and the foam gun is something that uh, attaches to your garden hose, and it will pre-mix car soap, and it sprays it with a, with a foam head. Mm-hmm. And the cool thing about them is um, you don't need the bucket. The bucket is bad. Mm, yeah. The bucket, right? And the reason why a bucket is bad is because if you got a typical rag or a wash mitt and say you rinse the car and then you got your bucket full of soap, every time you dip back into that, you know, you're taking all the crap that was on the car and putting it in the bucket. Putting it back in the bucket, which is staying on your rag. Right. Which is going back on your car. That's right. So many years ago, uh, one of my smarter friends that I grew up with became a chemist instead of a, you know, a Yahoo like me. Mm -hmm. All right. and his the chemical company he was working at was retailing these foam gun attachments. And what they were using them for is to, ironically enough, sterilize uh, medical centers. Really? So huh. you'd put a, a quaternary disinfectant in the, uh, in the hopper and then spray foam all over, you know, an operating room or, you know, ah. a triage. And the foam increases the contact time with mm-hmm. the surface which breaks down perhaps viruses yeah how about that <laughs> and, and and sterilizes and i said you know what that'd be bitching to wash a car with <laughs> look at you look <laughs> yeah. at you visionary i know yeah how about it <clears throat> so what i do now is uh, uh use the the hose to do a a high pressure water rinse uh-huh. and then i'll spray foam on basically a third of the car at a time 
and then use a wash mitt and kind of, you know, suds that stuff off mm-hmm. and then rinse it and then move to the next third of the car and foam it up All right. and re- repeat that process. So there's no bucket. Like you said, nothing's returning to the car. And, hmm. and I can spray the wash mitt in between to make sure that there's no pebbles or anything in there. Right. Um, and the interesting thing is uh, I, I once did a test. You know, it's like the, the mortal sin of washing a car is don't let the soap dry. Right. Don't Especially let that soap dry on there. That's right, because it'll be the end of all civilization. All humanity it. will will just fall Over. apart. Right, right. And that's not really true. Huh. <laughs> I would imagine a little bit of water would reconstitute that soap. Yeah, yeah how about and that? And let it wash off. How about that? Uh, that's right. And and so one day I was talking with uh, a gentleman named Gary, who's the chemist at Mother's Wax. And I said, what's the deal? And he's like... Well, we got to put that on the label because we don't want people to soap their car up and then just never rinse it ah. and then go off on their daily life. And, sure. and that, okay, so that makes sense. Uh-huh. But, um, it, you know, during this process, if, if the soap kind of dries on the car a little bit, no big deal. Give it some water. It's water soluble. It'll rinse right off. But what it will allow you to do is wash the whole car in 10 minutes. Wow. You know, you know pretty quick. So that's kind of step one. And even this big truck only took me about 15 to do. Jeez. Um, where the effort came in is with the wash mitt, actually scrubbing this thing, you know. Mm-hmm. Wax on, climbing. wax off, grasshopper. Oh, you know it. Yeah. You know, and climbing up on the running, the bumper, or I guess it's a Nerf bar, you know, kind of the running board bar. Yeah. And trying to reach the roof and everything. <laughs> I mean, this is the, the physically largest vehicle I've ever owned. Yeah, so. you the step ladder. I do, yeah, or a helicopter or something. <laughs> so uh, once it's clean, um, the next thing I like to do is a clay bar treatment, which I did not do yesterday because I didn't have the time. But yeah. if there is time, you ever clay a car? I have clayed a car once. Huge difference. Huge mm-hmm. difference in the turnout. I have, uh, you know, you feel the paint before you do it, and maybe you think it feels smooth. But then you clay bar properly clay bar a section and then and then dry it and feel it again. It's it's night and day. All the yep. contaminants that that pulls up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's pretty cool. The, the, I believe the clay bar actually came from the body shop industry. Is that right? They, they would use it to remove overspray. Ah. So yeah, you could be driving your daily driver and you know get the fender fixed and blended, and if they get any overspray on the hood or something, they would use a clay bar and it would remove the overspray. But it also removes organic compounds, pollen right. and bird droppings, yeah. and tar and sap and stuff. Mm-hmm. But th- there's a little bit of a racket when it comes to the clay bar industry because you buy the kit. It comes in a box. Right. You get a, a bar of clay and you get a bottle of detail spray. And some of them give you a, maybe a rag, a microfiber mm-hmm. or something. Well, what I do is take that bottle of detail spray and put it on the shelf. Okay. I'm going to use that later. Um, the detail spray is only there to provide lubricant for the mm-hmm. clay. So what they want you to do is spray about a two foot square area, take your bar, glide it over the paint surface, right. and then spray another area. And next thing you know, you've depleted your bottle of detail spray. Yeah. yeah not, before you even finish the car. Just in time right. to go buy more. That's right. But if you get yourself a hose foamer, ah, you just spray more suds on the car. Ah. And use the clay bar and the soap suds. And you can zing over the whole front end of a car in, in five minutes. You never, huh. you know, you just do one application of soap suds and then glide your bar all over the place. And then uh, all right. hit it again with a little more soap sud shot and your wash mitt. And it will take off any clay residue that might be there. Because sometimes when you change directions on the clay, it sticks. Yeah. It kind of parks itself. Under. Sure. And you can do a whole, you can clay bar a whole car in, again, 10, 15 minutes. If you know what you're doing. So, yeah. and then you got your detail spray for, you know, what it was meant for going to the car show or a quick, mm-hmm. you know, touch up here and there. Uh, so then that's, that's kind of phase two. And then phase three for me, depending on the car, if it's a factory applied finish, like, like what's on our truck, mm-hmm. um, I'll use, uh, I actually use synthetic wax now on those. Okay, cool. And I was always kind of steering clear of the synthetic wax com- concept Probably because of the way it was it was marketed, mm. you know, in the in the '90s when this stuff was first coming out, you would see 
commercials where it's like they're frying an egg on the hood of the car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Space age polymers, you know, they, they went through 4 million car washers. Right, and right, right. Them. And I was always very afraid of sealing the surface. You know, I didn't want to seal. Ah. I just have a problem with sealing car paint. And because it's it, we paint cars at our shop, uh-huh. and we know that they, they outgas and evaporate solvents for months. Uh-huh. And if you put a, some kind of a sealer over that, you're asking for trouble. You're asking for the color to haze and the clear to, to haze over because that those solvents can't get out. Uh, but today, if it's a factory applied finish, those are baked at high temperature. Mm. And this car, this truck, you know, like I said, it's a 17, so it's a couple years old. So I'm not worried about that anymore. So I'll use a synthetic wax and I use a, uh, a random orbital buffer called the wax master, mm. which is something you can buy at any, any part store. And it takes a, a terry cloth bonnet or a microfiber bonnet. And you squirt a little on the on the bonnet and make sure it's covered, and then push the button and just kind of glide the thing over the car, and it applies all the wax for you. Cool. I recommend doing it in the shade. Uh, uh-huh. That's that's something you really don't want. That that's the you know like soap. You don't want the wax to bake on there just because it's going right. to be really hard to remove later. Yeah. Um, but you can if it's in the shade in a garage or something, you can do the whole car. You can you know, start to finish and then get yourself a couple of clean microfibers and wipe it off. Hmm. And if you're on your game and, you know, maybe you're out of beverages and you need to get somewhere, uh, <laughs> you can you can do a good sized car from from wash to clay to final wax in 35, 40 minutes. Get out of here. That's huge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And again, wow. it's not like show car, detail, right. Pebble Beach, ready to win everything. But it looks nice. It looks great. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and it's got good protection on it and everything, you know, looks good. So. All right. I'm on board. Yeah. Wax master. Uh, got it. I wrote it, that man. down. I'm going to have to look up that, that video. Uh, Cause like I said, it's 15 years old now. Mm-hmm. And, and Kelly actually did all the work on that when I was shooting the video and she was doing this whole process on her 62 galaxy. Ah. And, and I believe the storyline was, you know, what are you going to do if you got a hot date tonight and you've only got an hour to detail the car? Ah. Uh, we're here to help. <laughs> right on. <laughs> now, question for you. Do you, yeah, yeah. do you, is there a, do you have to take a different approach uh, to a car that has single stage paint versus uh, dual stage? Well, what you're going to find is a single stage paint is going to give up its paint. You're going to remove the oxidation. You're going to remove you know, mm-hmm. the outer layer of, of paint. But in the process I just described, we're not buffing anything. Uh-huh. The random orbital wax master is a jitterbug. It's not a spinning oh, okay. pad, right? So it's not cutting like a buffer. Oh, I see. Um, it, so it, it tends to not be as aggressive. So it's okay for single stage. And, and, and if it's a car that was like say painted at our shop for example and it was painted within the last six months we we tend to tell people don't wax them for about six months to let Uh them out gas again on those kind of finishes i'm going to use a a natural pure carnauba wax i'm not going to use a synthetic Uh uh-huh because the the carnauba you know wax has different uh, uh measurements for performance is the way i'll put i'll put it all right some some people want some people think a good wax is something they can wipe on their car in the spring and the water will bead on, on the next January 1st. Uh-huh. You know? It will protect that paint surface. And other people are all about the shine. They want a, a glossy sure. depth shine. Well, Carnuba wax doesn't last that long. It will wear off in the rain and everything in a few months. But it is also minimally um, minimally contains solvents. So it's not going to damage the paint. Okay. It's not going to soak into the paint with with solvents, if you if you follow. Sure. Um, and it shines really nicely, and it's really easy to use. So, like on your GTO, I, I would recommend a single uh, application of of pure carnauba wax uh, over the synthetic. Uh-huh. The goal on our truck uh, that I was describing is, I don't want this finish to get damaged. I don't uh-huh. want tar and 
acid rain and all that stuff to hurt this. So that's why I went with the synthetic. Another reason because it's a stronger product. Mm, okay. Of course, today the hot thing is the ceramics. Oh yeah. And a ceramic coating is a different thing than I described. That's more of an all-day deal. You want to do a paint correction first. Yeah. yeah. Which could involve wet sanding and buffing and polishing, mm-hmm. and, and and then the ceramic use. Uh, but all of your major wax manufacturers are doing an at-home ceramic wax now that you can apply. Yeah, I've seen so, that in action. That's that's amazing stuff. Have you used it or? I haven't what? used it, but I've I've seen some YouTube videos of some people who have done it on their car, and you know they dump mayonnaise on their car and it like it falls right off for crying out loud. Right, which is a problem because there, yeah, there's often... a lot of mayonnaise flying around. <laughs> <laughs> I find that, you know, in my garage, I'll come out on a Saturday and all of a sudden all the cars are just covered in mayonnaise. Gosh dang it. I know. Who's got all the mayo? Every time. I keep telling them to hold the mayo. <laughs> <laughs> got them. Nice. Next thing you know, it's dripping off the car. Right. No, but that's really good stuff. And and uh, Trevor treated his, uh, his ZL1 Camaro to a... A ceramic treatment oh, did he? That, that he did. And it looks great. And and the term is hydrophobic. You know, the, yeah. the water repels from the... It, it'll be great. He'll... Whenever he drives that car to work and it might rain outside, you look mm. outside and the water's just running away from this thing. That's know? great. So I'll have to try the, uh, the ceramic products and see how they fit into my half hour wash clay wax. Yeah recipe and see if uh, we can improve upon that. I, I, do you remember, uh, I think it was in the 80s, there were commercials on TV, uh, and it was right around the time when auto manufacturers were, were switching from a single stage to a, a base coat clear coat application, and people were waxing their cars with a wax that was normally meant for their single stage paint and ruining their clear coat. And they're crying and like, oh my God, and... You know, yeah. it, the commercials for the wax that was safe for your clear coat. So, I mean, what do you, do you know what properties it was about the wax that was meant for your single stage paint that was ruining clear coat? Or was it the clear coat material? Well, I think you're, you're onto something. The early clear coats from the 80s were terrible. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, GM, you can't tell me you knew of any silver GM car that retained its clear coat more than a couple of years. I mean, it would peel off in sheets mm-hmm. and then the base coat is not designed to withstand UV or light and, and the elements and the cars just look horrible. And, right. and you know, the automakers were repainting cars on warranty like crazy. Yeah. And I think it's just because that was new technology and they didn't really have a handle on it. Um, the clears today, uh, especially the good ones are like iron. I mm. mean, they're, polyurethane clears um it's plastic it's like liquid plastic that's yeah. being put on a car and it uh it stands up to all kinds of abuse and the difference there is that in the old days when you were going to simonize your car you know mm-hmm. or, or, or use a, a turtle wax product or yeah. something um a lot of those waxes had a, a compound element oh. it was a polishing compound so there was some grit in them okay and the reason why you wanted to do that was because you wanted to physically remove that top layer of oxidation and fading paint okay, to get right. down to the rich color yeah. and, and really all bring that. It well, on a clear, out. yeah, you don't want to cut through any of that no. because the clear protects that base coat, you know, mm-hmm. from from changing colors and oxidizing. That makes sense. And I think maybe that's what they were doing is using a lot of these aggressive polishing waxes and today you can buy polishing wax mothers has a a carnauba that has a they call it a cleaner wax yeah and it, it's pretty aggressive where it'll it'll kind of dig in and, and remove stuff uh-huh. um, but it's not really designed to be a a rubbing compound you know like I the good see. old days uh, which you can still get that stuff too you know rubbing compound you know here's a trivia question i should probably save for next time but no, um, no, let's have it <laughs> one of the guys who was a pioneer in painting cars was a custom painter in Southern California named Larry Watson. Mm. And Larry Watson um, was one of the first guys to really kind of do flames in mass, oh. you know, I don't I want to say mass production because every, every car was painted by hand. Right. But he made flame jobs possible, and he marketed the service where you could bring a car and he'd paint flames on it. Cool. 
And the the image of a, a Larry Watson flame job. First, they called them crab cl- crab claw flames. Okay, I see. I can see where you're going with that. Yeah. Right, yeah. because the the flame lick was kind of short and yeah. C shaped. Yeah. Right, and it looked kind of like a crab claw. Uh-huh. And I think the opposite of that would be what I will call a speedy flame, which is like what uh, Bobby Alloway does, where it's a really long, drawn out flame. Okay. You know, that looks like it's going 100 miles an hour. Sure. But the way Larry Watson did his paint fades to make the flame colors, the yellow, orange, red, Mm -hmm. um, is he would paint all those colors and stack them, and then he would use chrome polish, and he would polish through them. Oh, really? To reveal the color underneath. Oh, cool. Right? And and so if you look at these flame jobs today, this is back in the early 50s, they, they look like... Uh, they're kind of splotchy looking, you know, because it's not an even sprayed fade. It's a rubbed through fade. Ah, okay. And, and many of those cars were pinstriped by uh, uh, Von Dutch himself, you know, huh. back in the day. And it's pretty cool to see that that original style stuff. So Yeah, that is cool. Makes me want to dig up an old issue of Hot Rod and take a look at it. Yeah, they're out there. I think there's three or four good qu- trivia questions I just threw right out the window. It's okay. Appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, <I bet. laughs> You're going to have to use that uh, Alex one next time. You're all out. <laughs> I'm sure I will. And it's funny, you know, you mentioned the magazines. I'm noticing that since the, the 10 magazine company uh, owned by discovery canceled all those 19 titles. And right. we, ha- we had that discussion before that people are really starting to, to miss those. And I think, I'm a member of a couple of Facebook groups that are all about car magazines. Oh. You might want to check this out. It's pretty cool. Okay. Pe- people are posting images and covers from car magazines from the the 50s, a few from the 40s, but all the way through to within the last couple of years. And, and people are very nostalgic for seeing these articles sure. and cars and layouts and stuff all over again. And, uh, just today, as a matter of fact, I had a conversation with our buddy Terry McGeehan, who's the executive editor at Hemmings. Um, and here's a little preview. You want to keep your eye on the June issue of Hemmings uh-huh. Muscle Machines Gee, Magazine. Kevin, but, why is that? Yeah, I don't know. You'll have to subscribe <laughs> now, and hopefully it'll come in time. <laughs> but anyway, um, we were talking, there's a few new magazine upstarts that have come out of that, which are kind of cool. And, hmm. and, and Hemmings is always doing, a, in my opinion, do a great job of, of covering uh, what they cover uh, between Muscle Machines and Hemmings Motor News and, and the variety of titles they produce. But there's a Street Ride magazine coming out, a brand new one. Um, cool. And, of course, our friends at Wheel Hub magazine, which is uh, uh, done by Stephen Kim and uh, – Robert McGaffin and, and his crowd are launching a Mustang magazine. It's called Mustang Hub. Oh, wow. And we wish them the best of success. And they're, they're just kind of filling the hole that was left, you know, by these other titles. Yeah. And what we were all afraid of is that by Discovery pulling out of print, you know, we didn't want the world to think that that delegitimized print in general. Yeah. I mean, I, I like a magazine. I mean, I you know, I it's it's cool to read an article online and all that, but I I like that tactile feel. I like being able to thumb through the pages. I like the high glossy photography. It's the whole experience is complete. You can't mimic that online. So no, and you you they to try. You can yeah, come close with the online page turners and stuff like that. But um, I'm with you. And and recently, I was fortunate enough to uh, kind of be gifted if you will um a whole bunch of 50s and 60s car magazines oh cool so little page rod and customs and and honk before it became yeah. car craft yeah yeah and uh and hot rod and uh you know a lot of early stuff and and i haven't had time to kind of go through them uh and then of course car craft in the 60s and super stock and some mm-hmm. of the drag racing magazines 
which I use for reference, you know, believe it or not, when doing muscle car of the week, <laughs> I try not to make all that up. <laughs> uh, but interestingly, just the other day, I was looking at a magazine that I, I bought actually online for one of our customers. We have a guy a few years ago, we, we built this uh, 55 Thunderbird, the, the Coyote Bird right. uh, project car. And this guy had a 55 T-Bird new. Hmm. And he, he put, of all things, he put a Pontiac engine in it. All right. <laughs> yeah, back in about 57 or 58. Fantastic. And he ground his own camshaft. Get out of here. Holy cow. And he had eight two-barrel carburetors on it. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That was crazy, yeah. And this guy went on to own this giant manufacturing business. He's a brilliant engineer. He's in his 80s now. But I thought, you know, it'd be kind of cool to find an old road test of a 55 Thunderbird. Yeah. So as part of a uh, a three magazine package I bought off eBay, I found a, a magazine called Speed Age magazine. Hmm. Never which was all of about it. racing. Yeah, I didn't either back in the fifties. And I one was the the T Bird road test, so I gave that to him. And the other couple I saved. And just the other day, I was going through a Speed Age from nineteen fifty two, and mm. it is you wouldn't believe how sophisticated a magazine this is. Really? You would think it was written today. The the race coverage is spot on. There's there's some tech stories in it. And as you flip through the advertising, here's Edelbrock and here's Iskandarian. Oh man. And here's and a lot of companies that we're familiar with today that that have been around that long. And it's really cool to see these old ads and know that these companies still exist. So huh. look for that on the V8 Speed and Resto Shop Facebook page. I'm going to scan some of these old ads. Good. And, and I was just going to ask you, what's the possibility of uh, reproducing that online for us? Yeah, pretty pretty easy. So Good. Uh, I'll share those. That's, that's, that's pretty neat. I, I dig all that old stuff. Oh, yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah, I, I loved, I mean, I, when I was a kid, I loved reading. Um, I used to subscribe to Popular Hot Rodding, and I remember... Uh, re- reading about stuff like, oh my gosh, they, they're putting a turbo on this small block Chevy in the 69 Camaro and, and it's going so fast and just all the other cool tech stuff. And, uh, you know, I, I even liked reading the letter from the editor and, and the, you know, right behind the first, the first page and uh, just kind of getting a feel of, of what, uh, what the, what the issue is going to be about. So, yeah. And I don't remember which magazine it was. One of them had the letters to the editor column was called post entry. And it was kind of that. playing words with post, you know, being the postal right. service and, uh, and, and post entry was kind of a drag race term. Cartoons magazine in the late sixties, it was called pest entry. <laughs> <Is that right>? <laughs> <laughs> nice. The readers were pestering the, uh, the <laughs> perfect, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's pretty cool. So, you know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out a cool way to display these things without destroying them, mm-hmm. you know, maybe scan some, covers and, and print them and hang them on the wall or something cool uh but it's in all honesty I, I don't even know what i have i haven't even inventoried all this stuff yet so i gotta go through it but yeah that definitely needs to happen this summer there's another one that's a yeah. quarantine project yeah man you got nothing but time i got nothing <laughs> i'm not but, even asking you to time. remodel your bathroom just go through your <laughs> magazines well i already gotta you know put a lift in the garage and all the rest of it so. that's right <laughs> <laughs> Get it ordered, and when it's shipping, you can go through your magazines. How right, about that? Right. I do have the very first Hot Rod magazine that I ever got. Is that right? Yeah, it's about 1981. And uh, sounds right. My aunt Jean. So you you met my cousin Don Osti, yes. who uh, we did that '65 Chevelle for him yep. many years ago. His mom is to blame for all this. Is that right? Yeah, for Christmas one year, she bought me a subscription to Hot Rod. Oh, very cool. Yeah, and that was it. So That's it, Aunt Jean. You created right. a monster. Yeah. God bless you. Yeah, that's good yeah. stuff. That's great stuff. Yeah, pretty wild. Mm-hmm. All right, man. Well, we're, uh, we're coming up to the, uh, what I would call the bottom of the hour, even though it's who knows when it is. <laughs> this whole show is at the bottom. <laughs> Our brown show. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so I know I can hear the anticipation for everybody trying to figure out what an ambulance oh, it's, is. It's heaving, the anticipation. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Thank you. 
Um, so why don't you go first and see if I was even close? All right. So I asked you uh, where the term, what the term shotgun, I got shotgun means and what its origins were. And you said it means to be sitting in the front seat of the car in the passenger seat, not driving, but in the passenger seat. And that is right. Abs- I'll stand by that. Ab- that is absolutely right. Uh, right on. Yeah. And the origins you said were from the, like the old West about the, it was the position sitting next to the person who was driving the coach, but they would sit next to them with a shotgun being on the ready to thwart any would be bandits looking to rob them of their wares. And right. again, Kevin, that is absolutely correct. Ding, ding, All ding. Right. Congratulations. So I got uh, parts one and two. Yes, sir. Both correct. Well All played. Right. Well done. Well, thank you. Uh, so the question I posed to you yeah. is where did the term ambulance come from? Yeah. And your answer was, and I quote, oh, to quickly move sick people from one place to another from where they are sick to the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> you make it sound so terrible. When I said it, it was great. <laughs> it was great. I'm just reading what you said. <laughs> and to our listeners, you can rewind the show. See, I'm not. I'm not making this up. Uh, which, you know, I guess pretty much makes sense. Um, the the, uh, I guess the direct translation is actually a mobile field hospital. Oh, really? Yeah, but the the etymology of how this word came about, it starts with Latin and it the word ambulant, which means walking oh. in Latin, uh, which then got kind of translated to French, uh, which is hopital ambulant, ah. which means mobile horse-drawn field hospital. <laughs> and then it ends up in English, which is ambulant, which you nailed as being mobile. Uh-huh. So I'm going to give it to you. It, oh, it's a, it's a my mobile gosh. hospital of some sort to quickly move sick people from one place to another from where they are sick to the hospital. That is two in a row. One more, Kevin, and that's called a winning streak. <laughs> <laughs> Three's the streak. Huh? That's right. <laughs> yeah, right on. Well, that's outstanding. Everybody wins. That's a big that? yay for all of us. Yay. And, uh, and, and we like those. Uh, so what, what I will say at this point is, uh, we appreciate everybody listening to, to V8 radio, uh, even in these challenging times that we live in. Um, if you like this kind of stuff, there's many ways to subscribe, which we recommend, uh, through iTunes, Apple podcasts, Spotify, tune in radio, Google play, Google podcasts, Stitcher radio, iHeartRadio, radio, player FM, Podbean, Podchaser, of course, our V8 radio.com website. And as I, I said last time, whatever it is that's easiest for you, go check it out. Um, and Please one thing and that's, thank you. What's interesting is the nature of podcasts is the, the file lives on our server, but the information to get the file is what's shared on all these other services. Oh, okay. So the file, if you listen to, to uh, iTunes, for example, or Apple Podcasts, you're not listening to it coming from Apple. You're, it's coming from us, from the V8 Speed and Resto and V8 TV Productions yeah. server. It's just coming through um, Apple. And what that does, though, is it allows us to know how many uh, plays it's getting, how many pl- times that file was streamed. I got gotcha. you. And kind of where they're going. And interestingly enough, I think people are taking my advice because I said our own website is kind of a hassle. I told people not to go there. And from our last episode, the streams from our own site are way down, mm. but it seems like the overall streams are up. So oh, that's cool. Right on. Thank you, people. Yeah. The last thing we want to do is is hassle people. Lord knows they get hassled enough just by the content. <laughs> yeah, we, right. we don't want to hassle them to get to the content. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right on, man. Well, this was a lot of fun. Yeah. Always. Appreciate the time. Uh I'll be expecting some photographs of your freshly detailed uh, GTO, even though it doesn't run yet. Even though it doesn't run. Uh, Using the easy breezy techniques I've shared. Easy breezy beautiful. I got to get me a (laughs) wax master and uh, and and a sprayer with uh, the hose foamer. The hose foamer. That's it. There you go, man. Yeah, I'm writing that down too. Lord knows you got nothing but time. (laughs) Yeah, you think. 
All right. Well, we will look forward to that. When you get that done, share that picture on the Facebook page. Okie doke. And uh, keep the shiny side up. We will see you next time on V8 Radio.